Okay, folks. Well, uh, we are here on Healthcare Unfiltered, and I am going to tackle a topic I know literally probably um, maybe one percent about, and that's probably being generous. Um, but the good thing about being a host is you bring people who are smarter than you and know more than you, and you get them to talk, and then I'll shine just because I'm the host. But uh, uh, in all seriousness, uh, I wanted to tape several episodes on women's health in general, because there are certain topics that are really very specific to women's health that the public or, 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 or us may not be really fully aware of. Uh, so I wanted to bring in uh, four experts uh, in that arena in general and focus on a particular ailment called hyperemesis gravidarum. So uh, I have four amazing guests who spend uh, their time um, uh, in that space, and we're going to uh, get started by introduction. So first of all, thank you so much for coming. This is all your first time on Healthcare Unfiltered. I'm hoping it's not the last time. So if I play my cards right, I'll get you uh, again. So uh, we, we, we go always by hopefully first name basis, all of us. So Amy, why don't you get us started a little bit about you, uh, where you are, what you do, and and how did you get involved in um, maybe women's health in general as a topic and hyperemesis gravidarum? Well, um, so my name is Amy Brekdasher. I'm an OBGYN physician. I'm in Ventura, California. Um, and I, I got involved in women's health a very long time ago. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I, had hyperemesis gravidarum in my pregnancies, and that's when I got interested in um, in hyperemesis specifically. Um, it was very clear that what I had been taught in residency and medical school was inadequate, and that there was a lot that we needed to do to make people more aware of way to treat patients, um, make patients aware of the condition, families aware. And so I've been working on that ever since. And it's been about 20 years now that I've been involved in uh, the hyperemesis uh, foundation and hyperemesis uh, in general. Thank you so much for coming on. And then next, Kimber. Hi, I'm Kimber McGibbon. I'm a registered nurse and I'm the executive di director of the Hyperemesis Education Research Foundation. And I got involved in this after my first pregnancy when I had hyperemesis and I did get the treatment that I needed. So I started the foundation to actually start out as a website with lots of educational information and, and support and things like that. And so over the years, we've just, um, I've met with these wonderful ladies and we've uh, you know, worked on research and uh, patient care advocacy, patient tools, clinician tools, all kinds of um, options at a, a big website that uh, gets um, about a quarter million visitors every year. And we uh, help thousands of women all over the world get through their pregnancies. So uh, I've been doing this for about 22 years. So Amazing. Thank you. Kelly? So I am Kelly. I'm a chair of the board of directors of the Heart Foundation. And I had high premises and it was a long time ago, back in 2005, and my doctors didn't know how to treat it. And I was very scared, very alone and so sick. And there was a fledgling little website that was <laughs> help her that Kimber had started at the time. I didn't know it was Kimber, um, but very rapidly, this foundation has become a leader in disseminating information and ideal treatment protocols um, for high premises. And what's frustrating and why I'm involved is that so many physicians and medical schools and the government have no idea how to optimally tr treat this, um, this condition. And it's just very frustrating for all the patients. So I work with the foundation to um, help with you know, getting those protocols more in place. And one of the goals here, obviously, look, if we reach one patient, if we reach one woman who is having these issues, it's a success, right? Because there may be other folks out there who, who are not aware of, uh, of what you're doing. Uh, next is Marlena. Uh, yeah, I'm Marlena Fazo, and I have a PhD in genetics from Harvard University, where I first started my path to women's health research and found the first genes for uterine fibroid tumors. 
Uh, and then I did a postdoc at UCSF where I studied breast cancer, but at that time I got pregnant and had hyperemesis. Uh, and so I started to look into hyperemesis and found that there was so little known about it. There was so little research on it. And so I then decided to start researching hyperemesis and uh, I've been researching it ever since. I partnered with the HER Foundation and uh, we've done many, many studies, breakthrough studies on hyperemesis. Feels like there's some car somewhere backing up, and they have yeah. a picture. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's it's uh, that, it's don't worry. It's unfiltered. We don't even edit anything. It's perfect. <laughs> people like it. Realize. <laughs> Amy, I want to start with you a little bit. I just want to have a definition, right? Let's say somebody is just tuning in. When we're saying hyperemesis gravidarum, it's a lot of words and a lot of letters and so on. Simplify this with what are we talking about? So the simplest definition is excessive vomiting in pregnancy. There, the traditional definition has um, included a 5% weight loss um, that was caused by that nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Um, but recently there was an international uh, Congress that came together and came up with a new definition and it um, is nausea and vomiting that is severe and um, affects your ability to function and care for yourself um, during pregnancy. So it's not unusual for folks to say, you know, in the first trimester, women get, you know, uh, nausea, morning sickness, things like that. We're not talking about this. We're talking much more severe. Exactly. About 70% of people will get some kind of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Um, but hyperemesis is more severe. It affects your ability to eat, to drink, to care for yourself, to care for your family, to go to work. Um, and uh, often you'll see weight loss, you'll see dehydration. Uh, patients will get malnutrition malnourished, they need to be admitted to the hospital, they need to get intravenous nutrition in the emergency room. And that affects a much smaller percent of pregnancy. It also lasts longer than the first trimester. Um, it generally peaks later and lasts longer than normal morning sickness. Often uh, patients will have nausea and vomiting through the end of their pregnancy. Um, I, uh, during my pregnancy, I was unable to eat at all. I was on IV nutrition until the day after I delivered my son. Is there, are there any reliable statistics in terms of the instance and prevalence? In other words, you know, how, how common is this amongst people? So um, it really depends on how you define it. Some studies have looked at hospitalizations as a definition, and that's probably in the one to two to percent range. If you're looking at requiring medications, requiring increased visits, requiring emergency room visits, that's a bigger number. And um, it's hard to know exactly what that number is. But it's fair to say, you know, like in total, less than 5% of pregnancies might, mm -hmm. might experience hyperemesis gravidarum. Right. Something yeah. like that. It's probably something like that. Kelly, what, uh, tell us through whatever you feel comfortable sharing with us, your personal experience, what, what, what happened uh, to you? So my personal experience was um, going into a pregnancy, so excited to be pregnant, and at five weeks, suddenly getting nauseous. And of course, everyone says, oh, that's typically celebrate, you know, that means you're pregnant. Um, and, but it very quickly became completely debilitating. Like, it's so overwhelming that getting up from the sofa is too much, like it will make you vomit, just the vomiting is, is nonstop. And um, I, my condition, like I ended up having in-house IVs for hydration. My case wasn't as severe as many of 
the cases where you do end up on the nutrition, which is true here. Um, and, and for that, you know, it, it just, it becomes really uh, an emergency of health for the women that struggle with that. But for me, um, you know, got through it, had, uh, as I say, I just feel like I was really fortunate because I was able to carry to term, but that's not always the case for the condition. And this happened in your first pregnancy and subsequent pregnancies or just the first? It happened in my first pregnancy. And then I was like, I'll do it again because you forget and um, how bad it was. But the second pregnancy, because of the Her Foundation and the protocols that these three women put together, actually, um, I was able to have a second pregnancy that was much more controlled uh, thanks to the treatment that I was given and medication treatment, being on top of hydration, was able to eat more. And so it's really about just having these tools and knowing how to best treat it so that people can have successful pregnancies. Kimber, what's your personal experience? How did this, how, how, th how did things happen to you? Uh, for me, um, I got pregnant uh, really early after I got married. <laughs> it was a little honeymoon surprise. And uh, I came home and uh, four weeks after we got married, I was, you know, sick and I wasn't sure what was wrong. And five weeks later, I was in the hospital for the first time for IV fluids. And um, it was just a real struggle. I dropped down to what I weighed when I was about 13 years old. And um, they kept saying, well, maybe we'll give you IV nutrition, but they just, I was seeing a midwife and she was not comfortable with that. So I basically starved through a lot of my pregnancy. I had points where I could eat for a, a few weeks and I gained a little bit of weight and I go, oh, you're good. And then I, then I'd start dropping back down again. So by the time I had my first child, um, I was very weak. I could barely lift five pounds and I couldn't, um, I couldn't function hardly at all. And uh, I had my son and uh, we had a lot of problems. I had complications during delivery, complications, a very long recovery. Um, my child had issues and it was just a really tough road. And I was like, there has to be more options than this. Uh, there has to be better care. I mean, nutrition should have made a difference, but I wasn't given that. Um, and you know, that the care overall was just very inadequate. And I wasn't sure whether to depend that on the lack of knowledge, the not seeing a high enough specialty area of expertise. Uh, but anyway, so then I had a second pregnancy and while it was better in some ways, cause I have more medications, it was still really bad. So during that time period, I did some writing and research on HG as far as looking back in time, reviewing all the literature out there and put together the website and information on HD and uh, met Marlena and eventually AMA. And um, we, you know, just have been trying to get all this information and protocols out there because if I had had that when I was pregnant, uh, I would have had a completely different pregnancy. Just some of the nutritional information we know, like thiamine and stuff, that's very important that very few doctors know about. Um, and I think that would have made a big difference for a lot of us because there's a lot of cognitive impact when you don't have, when you don't have enough time. And so, um, for me, it was just, um, you know, surviving and both of my children were affected and I was told not to have any more children because I just probably would not be able to, you know, make it through another pregnancy. So for us, it was limiting our family and, um, having a lot of residual complications like trauma from two, two traumatic pregnancies and deliveries and just very difficult, um, recovery processes. Did you have any other pregnancies? Do you have any other children? Nope. We just have the two. I had three miscarriages, but I had just the two children. And I just realized I've been calling Amy, Amy. So I apologize. I think Kimber okay. just pronounced your, your name properly. Uh, <laughs> Marlena, uh, what's your personal story? How did things happen to you? Yeah. So in my first pregnancy, I lost about 15 pounds um, and I was never diagnosed, even though I went to the hospital twice to the ER for fluids. I just mostly laid in bed, but it did get better uh, towards the uh, beginning of the second trimester. And so um, and that for that pregnancy, I was able to have a healthy child. Um, in my second pregnancy, it was much, much worse. I like Aime was very, very sick. I couldn't move without vomiting. So I was basically frozen in my body. I couldn't get up to go to the bathroom. I couldn't drink. I couldn't eat uh, without vomiting. Um, so I just had to lay completely still for weeks and they finally put me on TPN, but I think it was too late and the baby died at 15 weeks. 
And so after that, I decided to really devote myself to figuring out what this was, because I really felt like I was being poisoned to death. And I, I knew that there was something there uh, that had to be discovered. <laughs> I'm, very, so I'm very sorry to hear. And um, I think I, I, um, I heard um, sometimes from tragedies, um, good things emerge eventually. So, um, but I certainly am very, very sorry for, for the loss that you had. Um, Amy, I said that correct, right? This time? <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, but uh, yes, perfect. I want to. I want to ask you, Amy, about um, in medical school. I mean, you said you've been doing this for twenty years. So I don't want to talk about where we are now. I want to talk a little bit back. Obviously, this phenomena is published in textbooks, and you've read about it. Take us back to when you were a resident and you were learning about. OB gynae, obviously, in residency. What were you taught? What were you told pretty much uh, at the time in terms of the condition and how you should approach it? So I was taught the basics of the condition, that it exists, that we treat it with medications. One of the things that um, I was taught was that some people think that it is a psychological condition and um, that it is because either people, women don't want to be pregnant or it is actually a sign of a uh, conversion disorder. Um, and, uh, and that it's something that maybe women are, are doing to themselves that, oh, they need to be admitted to the hospital because they need a break from their lives, not because they need intensive medical treatment. Um, I was taught a very limited number of medications that we could use um, for hyperemesis. And I wasn't really taught how to think through those medications. Uh, I had probably an algorithm of three different medications. If I got to that third one and it didn't work, I didn't know where to go at that point. Um, and I knew that some patients might need IV nutrition, but I didn't really know when that should be when do you decide to give patients IV nutrition? The other thing that I think that I learned and I think is a, still a very common, uh, commonly taught and commonly uh, that it's thought of is that this is a self-limiting condition, that it will go away, the mom suffers and the baby will be fine, but it's, it's going to end no matter what. So you don't really have to worry about it that much. And what we found a lot through the research that Marlena has done um, is that it's not a self-limiting condition and it has long-term consequences for both mom and baby. And it has those devastating complications like Marlena had, um, I also had a loss at 18 weeks with my first pregnancy, and um, we were able to show that there is an increased risk of pregnancy loss, especially in the second trimester, where it's otherwise very rare. And those are things that are that, that were missing in my education, um, and that I think they're still missing in the current education. What were you taught that, um, so you were taught uh, supportive care, pretty much, uh, kind mm -hmm. of nausea and, and sometimes do IV nutrition. And were you taught that sometimes you may have to terminate the pregnancy and do abortion uh, in if it doesn't get better or was that not right. part of the two? Yeah, that was part of the tree. It was like, basically you have the three medications and then well, there's termination as an option as well. And, or you can just wait it out and you know it'll go away and everybody will be fine and so uh, so so marlena 
you know, you're a scientist and uh, you start, you obviously have personal experience and you know the issue. How do you start? Like, how do you start investigating a problem? Where, where, where do you start from and, and to, to try to understand um, what the issues are so you could at least help the clinicians and the patients? Well, there was so little known and there were so many questions that we wanted to answer. And so we started off with a survey, a very long survey. And these are people that are stuck in bed with nothing to do but to think about how horrible they feel. So people answered that survey. And in the beginning, it was before email and all that. I mean, people faxed us these answers to these long surveys, and then we had someone inputting it back in the day. Um, but yeah, so people from all over the country and then all over the world later were answering these surveys. And so one of the questions, since I'm a geneticist, was to see if it was genetic. And before you can get any funding for genetic studies, you need to show that it runs in families and provide some evidence that it's genetic. Uh, so we started uh, you know, with the familial aggregation study where we compared how many people had family members who had it to those who didn't like sister-in-laws or, uh, and what we found was that there was a 17 fold increased risk of having HG if your sister also had HG. So that uh, gave us more evidence that it is genetic, even though I don't have it in my family and uh, other people don't, but people don't understand that you can still have it in your genes, if you, even if you don't see it in your family, because first of all, it can come from your father's side and your father can't have HG um, and it can come from your father's father. So you would, may not ever see it in your family. Um, many people, you know, that's 25% don't. Um, and then it can also be a combination of genes and or a combination of genes in the environment. So you don't always see it in your family, but uh, there definitely is an increased risk. And then uh, another group did another genetic study and they uh, where it's a classic twin study and they also found a very high heritability risk for hypogrammasis. So um, then we had some good strong evidence that it was genetic. And so we started to, in addition to the surveys to collect uh, saliva samples for DNA from patients. And um, so in addition to the genetic studies, uh, we also had this long survey so that we could collect other information to answer other important questions like what is the recurrence risk, because that's really what everybody wants to know after one HG pregnancy. Am I going to have this again or not? And what is the risk that I'm going to have it again? And so we did a study on recurrence and um, many other studies we've done. We've published, you know, 30 plus papers on hyperemesis from these surveys. So were you able, uh, using the DNA, were you able to isolate an actual gene that gets passed on from through, through family members? Yes. So we, um, we partnered with 23andMe, the personal genetics company, in our first genetic study. And we found um, by surveying all the genes in the genome that one gene stood out more than any others as being associated with HG, very significantly associated. And that gene is called GDF15, and it codes for a hormone, a nausea and vomiting hormone. And that nausea and vomiting hormone is expressed very highly in the placenta during pregnancy. And uh, in addition, that hormone very interestingly also is expressed by some cancers. So cancers um, can make GDF-15, it gets into the bloodstream, it goes to the nausea and vomiting center of the brain and causes what's called cachexia. And cachexia is that wasting syndrome that 20% of cancer patients die from. So they don't always die from their cancer, about 20% die from cancer cachexia, from that wasting away, not being able to eat or move or, or drink and just wasting away. And so um, what I tell people is that when people with HG say they feel like they're dying, it probably is 
because they feel like they're dying, just like cancer patients with cachexia die from their disease. Um, so they really need the compassion. Um, they may need termination because they don't just feel like they're dying, they can actually die. So there are patients in the US and the UK in this century that have died from hyperemesis. Um, and that's something that surprises a lot of people, but it's a fact. And it's going to get worse with this lack of the ability to terminate because uh, patients, you know, that's a last resort because patients are maybe not able to get the care that they need. And so they end up having a therapeutic termination. And if that's pulled away from, from people as a choice, they will die. But your, your hope is to hopefully intervene. Um, you know, what, what you, when you said about the gene um, that you identified, we'll get into that in a little bit. I'm, I presume there's some research going on to counteract the gene or, some, or the protein or the hormone. So we'll go into that. But I, it's good that there's an identification of an actual gene that produces the hormone because now you kind of have a therapeutic target, I guess, that you're hoping to identify drugs for. Exactly. Yes. So um, we are, uh, there are many companies, especially because it's involved in cancer. Um, so it's, people are always scared to go into pregnant women with a new drug, but it's already uh, antibodies blocking this pathway are already being investigated in clinical trials to treat cancer cachexia. And they've perform very well in animal models. So animal models where they have too high levels of GDF-15, they have a cancer that's overproducing GDF-15 and they lose weight um, all the way to non-human primates. When they give them these antibodies, they stop vomiting or they lessen the vomiting. Um, They're able to eat and gain the weight that they lost back. And so we, we'll, we'll find out pretty soon what happens in humans and hopefully it'll be successful. So, uh, Kimber, you know, you had the personal experience and then you, you obviously, you've decided to take this a little bit uh, and, 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 and help others. Um, I guess, when did you realize there's very little out there that, uh, because you started this two decades ago or, or so, um, how much information was there? How, how were you able to, I guess, get some interest into this topic? I mean, you... You, you may have put in some of your personal money into the foundation, but I presume you want also fundraise and other things. Take me through the process, how you really get this off the ground and how you generate interest in a topic that you probably presume that there's very little interest in. Well, unfortunately, that is a huge issue because even now the medical societies have not been like the OBGYN type societies have not been super interested in HG. And when I began back in 2000, after my first pregnancy, I actually pulled um, medical textbooks and literature all the way back to the 1700s um, from the medical library and online places and um, looked at all that. And there was just not much information, not like the one of the studies cited a an incidence rate of one to three or one percent. And when I looked back in that journal and followed the, the references back to the previous ones, it went all the way back to the 1800s. <laughs> and so people were just repeating a statistic without data behind it. And so I began to look in a little deeper and there were all these, all these um, complications and problems and things that were never really connected with the HG. So over the years, um, when I went online and, and found a survey that Marlena did years ago, back in 1999, she was putting a survey online. That's how we met. And, um, and, and realized that there's so many questions, like there, the data that comes from the 1800s is not applicable to 2000. <laughs> so um, I began putting that information together in the website. And then I began helping people that were trying to get through their pregnancies with additional information, other treatment options, like Amy said, you know, they're taught that it's a psychological condition. I mean, it used to be in the, the 20s to the 50s, standard protocol was to leave a mom in her vomit so she would understand that's not appropriate behavior. Um, it was, um, you know, telling her she was going to kill her baby and it was blamed on frigidity and all kinds of crazy, crazy 
you know, maternal conflict, you know, maternal role conflict and not wanting to be pregnant and things like that. And that's still being taught to some degree in medical schools today. Uh, we, we actually have a, a person in our community who filmed a lecture at an OB, um, at an OB school um, a university, major university in the United States, um, saying that mothers that have HG don't want to be pregnant. Um, they didn't talk about the genetics of HG. They just talked about how women didn't want to be pregnant, which is horrible because we get women refused care because they're told they don't want to be pregnant. They should just stop getting pregnant instead of getting giving them the care they need. So um, I put this website online and one of the families I helped was um, Amory and Jeremy King. And they uh, were so uh, grateful to have the help and to be able to survive their pregnancy because they didn't know if she and the baby were gonna survive. So they joined in me and helped me getting the website into a nonprofit foundation. And then over the years, we have created tools. AMA has been really instrumental in helping me with that. Tools and brochures and resources. And Marlena and I've done tons of groundbreaking, like foundational research, establishing that there's a high rate of um, termination and uh, there's um, a lot of, fetal loss and a lot of additional complications that come from HG and, uh, and then of course the genetics and then that psychosocial impact is enormous. I mean like 82% of women have an adverse psycho, uh, psychosocial um, issues such as uh, psychological complications like some mental health issues postpartum. They have um, you know job loss and uh, financial difficulties, marital strain, things like that. And so we've been trying to document all of this to generate interest. And we've begun to get some more interest from the uh, medical societies, but most of all, we get like individual doctors when we go to conferences like the SMFM conference and um, soon we'll be going to ICHG, which is the International um, Hyperemesis Gravidarum Conference. It's an international collaboration on HG. And we present our, our research in some way, abstracts, posters, presentations at these to bring this out, but um, it's it's slow moving. We're working on an educational uh, program for uh, physicians and trying to get, engage with the medical profession because really it's a very nuanced care. So I work with moms on a daily basis and sometimes doctors, depending on the situation. And it's very nuanced how you treat HG. It's not just give a medication and everything goes away. There's numerous symptoms. The more they're on bed rest, the more sick they get, the more problems there are. So it's very nuanced care and um, doctors are not trained this and most people don't know that information. So we're trying to put this into resources that we can get out and dis disseminate more widely. And so uh, we're hoping that by doing that and providing these that we can um, help the medical societies understand that doctors need these resources. They get excited about them when they get to, to see them at conferences. And we feel like that this is really critical to making a change because until moms get better care, um, then we're gonna to continue to have downstream complications like preeclampsia, prematurity, um, hemorrhage, sepsis, all these kinds of problems that, you know, they, because hyperemesis was months before, they're not linked to a hyperemesis, but we see it all the time, especially preeclampsia and prematurity. And so our goal is to prevent that. Um, so we're hoping that by in our, our research that we show links to these complications that more medical societies and doctors will understand. And I think it'll become more apparent um, now with the, reduce, the reduction in termination because uh, women will not have that option. So doctors will have to wait until women get to a life-threatening complication before they can um, terminate if they don't treat well. I mean, our goal is to get doctors to treat well so women don't have to make that decision. That's our goal. So Kimber, um, you, you mentioned there, there is an actual international conference for this, right? You said the, yeah. so the and this is a new thing or it's been going on for a while. I wasn't aware there's an actual meeting dedicated to this. That's good, I presume. Yes. Yes. So um, it was, I think, 2015, I believe was the first year. And so it's every two years. And it's usually we've had them in London, Amsterdam. So, yeah, I got a cut the. Uh, last one got preempted by COVID, but uh, we're going to try and have one in London this year. And so it's all the scientists, some of the patients and clinicians and people that are interested in HG coming together. Uh, um, this may be a silly question, but is there a reason why it's not in the U.S.? Uh, well, they asked us to host it, but we have so much going on. I'm not on. complaining. I'll go, to I'll go to London to, to podcast there, but I just, I just wondered. 
Well, you know, part of it is that, to be perfectly honest, we're the only research team in the United States that's dedicated to HG. Um, there's only a few teams in the world that actually, I don't know, actually, I think we might be the only one that really is doing this level of research on HG. Um, Marlena is considered the top researcher in the world on HG. And so, um, yeah, there's just not a lot of research interest. There's not a lot of grant funding. The grants that come in the United States are uh, mostly for people seeking drug um, testing studies, RCTs on drugs. Yeah. So. so, so uh, Amy, um, I, I just, I heard from Kimber that there may be some of a uh, nihilistic uh, reception from large societies into the problem. Um, I think that she commented a little bit on that. There's a little bit of a, I, I don't want to call it dismissal, maybe I'm, that's being too harsh, but it, they're not as, I guess, excited about this particular medical problem. What is that? What, what, why is that? I think that there is still um, a lot of thought on HG that it is self-limiting and so they don't need to do this because it doesn't really cause big problems. Um, and I think there is very little recognition, like Kimber said, of the link of HG to later pregnancy complications. And so, and one of the things that we've focused on in the US with maternal, um, uh, morbidity is, is and it's actually more mortality and the top causes of mortality. Well, one of the top causes of mortality in pregnancy is, well, they're basically all of the top causes of mortality in pregnancy are linked to HG. One of them is sepsis, which is one of the things that we have seen the most patients die from with HG because patients are getting central um, venous access, they're getting uh, TPN and they're getting sepsis from that. But that's not the direct cause of death. It's not listed on the death certificates. It's not counted as that's um, why this patient died. We, there's more preeclampsia, which is hypertension in pregnancy is a major cause of maternal mortality. Um, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy is a major cause of death. Um, hemorrhage, and we, there's very high rates of preexisting anemia going into labor. And uh, when patients might have hemorrhage, there may be higher rates of hemorrhage as well. Uh, with HG, we don't really know if it's uh, specifically causing more bleeding, um, but the, there's very little understanding of the link of HG to what we're measuring as things we want to prevent. Yeah, great point. Uh, Bonnie, I just wanted to add on to that. And one thing, you know, is so is extremely frustrating to us as foundation and people that dedicate their lives to this, that the societies are not paying attention to this. And we try so hard. And like we go to these conferences and we set up all of our information. And definitely the interactions with individual physicians are really almost always extremely positive and they're really happy to have this information because they are at a loss and they feel very badly for their patients that are so sick. Um, so our inability to penetrate into these societies has been frankly baffling to us. One thing that we're pleased about, and I feel sorry for the people that <laughs> suffered as, you know, as a result from HG, but Kate Middleton having HG, Kelly Clarkson having HG, um, Amy Schumer having HG has been really helpful to bring some attention to um, to the issue. And we're happy to have Amy Schumer on our board to because she's willing to share a little bit of that, um, her impact with it. But 
something that we struggle with too is there's just a lot of lack of documentation of the financial information that is spent on this condition like so many women could be treated at home yet they go into the er and they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars so then ultimately of course that impacts um insurance companies and and if there's just so many different facets of this that it just feels like we should be able to streamline and just have this treated like so many of the other conditions of pregnancy Marlene, I want to go back to you because um, in identifying any, um, we'll go back into how to try to disseminate information, but going back to um, the problem at heart, you kind of, through your research, been able to identify um, the etiology. I mean, you, you know why it's happening. It's fair to say it is not in the woman's brain. It's not a psychotic episode. Uh, I mean, I think hopefully this, the ability to uh, identify the gene and sequencing, sequencing it, I presume, um, you know, dismissed all of these myths. So the next step, like we talked about, you said drug development, right? Because then you just give a pill, hopefully, and, and things get better. How do we get from point A to point B? Is there anything aside from drug development that you're working on or you're comfortable with the etiology? You've, you've finished, you identified the etiology, you know why it's happening, and now you're moving on to treating it. You're, you're done with identifying the cause. Uh, no, I'm not done, but we know that GDF-15 is the major player. Uh, we have unpublished studies where we've looked not just in our cohort, but in several other cohorts around the world now. And so the key player is GDF-15, um, but from our studies, we also know that the receptor for GDF-15, which is GFRAL in the brain can also be involved. And another co-receptor, RET, can also be involved. And uh, so, they, and there are other genes that are coming up. Um, they're not as strongly linked. Um, and so we are looking into those such as the progesterone receptor um, and other genes. So we are trying to understand now um, the biology. So it's not just, oh, you find this gene and that's the end of the story. Um, we're now we know that there are different variations in GDF-15 that are associated, but we don't know what those variations do to the actual hormone. Uh, so we need to really try to figure that out to see exactly what's going on. Are they causing there to be too much GDF-15 during pregnancy? Or are they overactivating the receptor? So there's a lot still about the biology that we need to figure out that will help to design better drugs in the future. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> and you mentioned something about that that receptor um, is similar, it's, it's analogous to receptors present in patients with cancer. Uh, so the, the hormone GDF-15 is the same hormone that causes cancer cachexia. So for some reason, in some cancers, they capture the, uh, this hormone and start to overexpress it, uh, and it causes the cachexia, the, the, which has very similar symptoms to HG. But there is no reason to think, not to think that it, the way you treat cancer cachexia then should hopefully work, right, to treat HG? Exactly. So um, those trials are uh, for cancer cachexia and chemotherapy, nausea and vomiting um, are in phase one right now or nearing phase two. And so um, we'll, we will, you know, as they move along to phase three, hopefully they will be successful. And then just like other cancer drugs that are treated off label to uh, for HG that have been developed for cancer, the same as the hope that it will uh, happen for HG as well. And, and what are these drugs you're, um, whatever you can share in terms of drugs you're excited about in development? I mean, right now, I presume, you know, you use Zofran and you use the, you know, the usual anti-nausea, anti-emesis that we use in cancer patients, uh, you know, from, from Ativan to Zofran to Aloxy to all of these drugs, I presume, I'm assuming. But um, Clearly, these are not the ones you're excited about. Can you share with us which ones you're excited about? 
So these drugs that are in clinical trials, they're antibodies that are targeted to GDF-15, the hormone that I was talking about, as well as GFRAL, which is the receptor in the brainstem. So uh, they will block that pathway and it's a different receptor than the 5-HT3 receptor, which is the receptor for Zofran. And so um, I think, you know, Zofran may help lessen the vomiting, but this seems to really be the nausea uh, or aversive center of the brain, this, this signaling pathway. Well, hopefully this move forward fast. Uh, Kelly, in your capacity, um, how do you disseminate information to the general public? How do you put on your activist hat and try to go out there and get people excited about a topic that they're probably not as excited about as you think they should? Well, we like to come on podcasts. <laughs> That's something we're trying to do right now. Um, I We just finished, as Kimber mentioned, we just finished filming um, a CME uh, series that we're hoping we will have out relatively soon. Um, a big, it, I, I think that our ability to disseminate information would be greatly enhanced if we actually were able to be provided more funding and grants and Unfortunately, I think that HG has a PR problem um, because it's just not very sexy <laughs> to talk about severe nausea and vomiting. Um, but we do, we, you know, we sell our merch. We have our Yeti cups here um, and we talk about it to whoever will, will listen. And we're excited because we have some traction for the first time um, with HHS. And we just had a meeting recently with HHS and HHS Texas. Um, interestingly, Texas specifically has a bill that they passed recently that they want to wrap their heads around HD treatment. And we're trying to figure out exactly how that bill came to pass, but we would love to have that all over. Um, with HHS there, uh, Biden recently has released a maternal health blueprint where he wants to improve um, treatment and access to care for all American pregnant people. And um, we are hoping that HG has a voice in there. And so far, so good. I think that they're receptive, unlike we've ever heard. And our ideal would be for the government to be able to issue some of these protocols that we have so that doctors are less inclined to dismiss this as a psychological case. I mean, you would just be floored at how often that's still happening. And I think one of the disservices of regular nausea and vomiting of pregnancy is that it's easy because there's a comparable illness to say, well, HG is just that. And it's absolutely not. It is, it is a wasting disease. Um, so we, we work on that. And Kimber for years has been working on getting it out there with our with our new website and developing the um, just all of the information. So she probably could speak to prior yeah. to and yeah. now. I mean, I want to talk to Kimber about this because um, I think Kelly mentioned uh, some of the celebrities that have been unfortunately also impacted by this. And I think, um, you know, I don't think celebrities should be treated any differently. We're all hopefully the same people, but obviously they have a louder voice and bigger access and larger platform. So we can take advantage of that. So how are you able to, I mean, it's good you got Amy Schumer on the board, obviously, and but how do you do you just like call call her and email her like you know I, I even know I mean I presume they you know they probably if I email Amy Schumer right now nobody's gonna listen to me but how do you <laughs> it's a serious question how do you get them yeah. to listen to you well Amy actually contacted me when she was pregnant to ask me questions about um, her treatment during pregnancy and then she was doing a uh, docu series uh, expecting Amy on her pregnancy. And so I flew to New York and was interviewed for that. So I'm in part two of that. Uh, so that's how I got to know Amy a little bit. And uh, we've kept in touch a little bit over the years. And so she was willing to be on our board and to help disseminate the information because it's of interest to her. And then also Andy Grammer's wife, Asia Grammer. Um, she's an ambassador for us. And she's been amazing um, putting uh, videos out there, uh, coming on our lives on Sundays when we do them and, uh, you know, adding stuff to her social media so that other people get to know the cause and um, the concerns for it. And I think Andy has posted some too, because she was on 
a Zofran pump during her pregnancy and they posted about it and, and thanked the Her Foundation for helping her during her pregnancy. And then there's other people like Kelly Clarkson, who we've um, been working to engage with. We've uh, talked with, like we've tried to engage with her, but have not gotten very far. And then there's other people like sports celebrity wives, like um, Aisha Curry and people like that. We've not had great success um, engaging all of them. We've also tried to engage with Maria Shriver who had HG. So um, it's it's a process. It's talking to them, letting them know what we do, helping them understand you know the process of how we work. But we bring them on as ambassadors or board members or whatever, and and have them be involved as they would like to be, and and hope that over time we can grow their influence and maybe eventually you know my dream is that we have some of these people get together and do a benefit concert or something for us, and uh, because we have. Uh, Marlene and I have worked on a shoestring budget for many, many years, and she's done an amazing job uh, getting some, you know, private grants for some of these funding for some of these studies. But a lot of our research funding comes directly just from our grassroots fundraising. So it takes a huge chunk out of our budget, um, but it's absolutely worth it. And it's amazing. But we would love to have um, just, you know, additional funding so we can hire additional staff. We, could, we have a lot of people internationally looking to work with us for education in Africa and, and some other places. And uh, we're just lacking in the resources. And if we had uh, some of these amazing celebrities step up with their voice and help us uh, get the money to come in, we could staff up with our capacity and we could actually begin doing, we've uh, talked with a couple of uh, foundations in Ghana who want us to come in and do education with them and um, also in um, Uganda and a few other countries, so Nigeria. So we would love to do these things. So we're just waiting for one amazing celebrity to step up or someone to come and, and offer us opportunities to have enough funding because we have the expertise. We have expertise that no one in the world has. Um, maybe some of the other, our colleagues in ICHG, but I just mean in the general realm of OBs and all of that, that they don't know how to treat HG. I just had a patient who lost her baby at 22 weeks. She lost 55 pounds and was never given nutrition. And she was basically skin and bones, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, and was being refused nutrition, even basic vitamins. So doctors were just like, you know what, um, you're fine. But she was in a rural part of um, the country and here in the United States and just didn't get the care she needed. So our hope is that someone's gonna step up and give us the opportunity um, to invest in us and give us the opportunity because we have the expertise. Um, we know um, a lot about HG and we can, we can make change. We can save money. Uh, we have moms that take very little medication and then go on expensive Zofran pumps or get hospitalized. And a lot of that could be prevented with better care. So there's a lot of things that we could do and we have that knowledge. We just need the opportunities and the um, resources to do that. And, and and how big is your foundation now? How big in what way? Like uh, how many people work uh, for the foundation? Well, we have about 14 board members that volunteer their time. And then we have a staff of two. <laughs> so it's small because, but we do a lot. <laughs> but I think yeah. I think that uh, you, you're already reaching out to celebrities. I mean, I, I, I believe that's going to help tremendously. It's It's already... Uh, it seems like Amy is definitely interested in that, and I think that that's great. But um, uh, Amy, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, are they interested in that entity to develop drugs? I think, um, you know, Marlene just mentioned, Marlene just mentioned about the, you know, several trials going on. Um, in addition to raising funds from celebrities and others um, and philanthropy, uh, is pharma interested uh, in that space? Unfortunately, um, pharma has very little interest in studying new drugs in pregnant women because of the liability concerns. And we, we've seen a, a few small um, pharmaceutical studies recently in the US on existing medications. Gabapentin was studied recently. Um, in some smaller studies, but there, there really isn't interest in these newer drugs in pursuing an indication for treatment in pregnancy. Now, I'm sure the drug companies would love for people to start using it in pregnant women, 
but 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 but, 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 that but, indication. but yeah. I don't I don't understand this if we have a condition that happens in pregnancy you have to study it in pregnancy um Kelly is this something you need to go and advocate with the HHS I mean how can you study a drug to work in pregnancy unless you study in pregnancy I'm confused <laughs> it's been a long-term issue in the U.S. Um, and and nobody. There are very few medications that we use in pregnancy as OBs that actually have an indication to be used in pregnancy. There's maybe a handful of drugs. Everything that we use in pregnancy is off-label. No, no, but I, and and I think I I get. For example, look, I want to let's say antibiotics, right? This is not, uh, they're not specific to pregnancy because anybody could get a sore throat and then you have to decide, do I want to treat, uh, you know, uh, with antibiotics? But this condition only happens in pregnancy. So you must study it in pregnancy. <laughs> no, Marlene, what, 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 what am I missing? No, you're absolutely right. It's just that Drug companies are scared and it's because of the thalidomide disaster that happened in the 50s and 60s where thalidomide was given to treat nausea and vomiting in pregnancy and it caused birth defects. And so since then, uh, it's just, there's a fear and the huge loss, lawsuit culture in the US um, has added to that uh, resistance. Yeah, yeah, there's a lawsuit. There's a lawsuit right now on the use of Zofran in pregnancy. Um, but, that, but that's still different. That's if you have a condition that happens only in pregnancy, then by default, you study it in pregnancy. And I believe the IRB and the ethics, I mean, they'll be okay with this. Kimber, is this something that you need to lobby with, I don't know with who, I mean, with the HHS and say, look, we got to study this. So the liability fact should be, withdrawn and women who are participating in this, they will sign an informed consent. Well, I think that there's definitely an opportunity there for some of the, the newer drugs. Like we haven't tried like a Loxy for HG, but you know, there's drugs like mirtazapine that are used and there's not much safety data, same thing with gabapentin. So I think that there's definitely a place for us to say, especially in these, in these patients that um, are considering termination or who have life-threatening complications, they're past eight weeks, so there's no fetal malformation issues, then this is a place where we have to consider offering these other medications. We have a mom who was in Ireland um, who was going to terminate and decided not to and came to the United States and got gabapentin and was able to continue her pregnancy. So there's definitely a place for us to say, yes, we need to study these and we need to look at these patients that make these choices to um, you know, choose a, a, a unknown safety drug um, instead of one that we have tested more. So. And when you think about that, like the pregnant, the, when you're pregnant, you're so terrified to do anything mm -hmm. like, you know, to have caffeine is, it would yeah. be scary. And so, you know, when you're already in this really weakened state and you're so worried about your baby, it's just like the thought of adding something that is potentially very risky is, overwhelming i think as well yeah i mean i think you know obviously the trade-offs it's the risk versus benefits right uh, amy it, exactly it's the risks versus benefits but we have long in this country um prioritized the baby over the mom in all facets of life i mean at, once you're a mother you're supposed to um devote everything in your life to your children and um, you know, you're blamed for everything that you do um, because you may not be doing the perfect thing for your children. And we do that in pregnancy too. And we do that in medicine too, where we prioritize um, the baby. And, uh, you know, as a mom, I choose to prioritize my baby in this situation, but there needs to be a recognition that, especially in HG, that if you're not treating the mom, you're also not treating the baby. The baby has long-term um, consequences from malnutrition in pregnancy as well. And so 
the the risk benefit ratio is is definitely um, pushed towards treatment. The treatment is going to be less risky than allowing the condition to progress untreated, both for the mom and for the baby. Because if you don't have a healthy mom, you don't have a healthy baby. Um, we see higher risks of um, autism and neurodevelopmental delays, pre prematurity, um, and, and you have to treat the mom. Yeah. Marlena, are there any long-term studies that for women who had hyperemesis gravidarum, um, as well as their, um, you know, born uh, children, um, because obviously you shared with us some, some might undergo abortion or undergo um, miscarriage, unfortunately. Are there long-term studies on what uh, any long-term sequela to the women and or the children? Yes, so Amy was just hinting at that for about the children. So um, there is now uh, several even very large studies, for example, study by Kaiser that show increased risk of autism spectrum disorder, um, increased risk of neurodevelopmental delay in the children. Uh, and in the mothers, there's increased risk of post-traumatic stress disorder, especially if they've had it for all nine months. Uh, so, yet there are definitely long-term consequences and increased risk of long-term consequences for both mother and child. And it is not true that in the case of HG, the baby is getting everything it needs from the mom. Um, there's also risk from the vitamin deficiencies, direct risk that we've seen um, in the cases of Wernicke's encephalopathy, where the mother is not getting enough thymine in her pregnancy or vitamin B1. And in that case, the mother can get brain damage or swelling of the brain. And um, the, the, generally the babies die for, uh, when the mother has Wernicke's encephalopathy in, in the majority of cases. Um, in addition, babies can be born with vitamin K deficient embryopathy um, because the mother is not getting enough vitamin K and there can be blood clots um, from the vitamin K deficiency as well. Another thing we see is, is emotional behavioral disorders. That's a really big thing. And sometimes we see those pop up, not necessarily in early childhood, but in later adolescence or early adulthood. And so that's another thing that's been of concern to us. Yeah. It, there were well, studies on the Dutch famine in, um, in Europe in uh, World War II. And those studies have shown multi-generational effects. So um, increased risks of metabolic disorder and um, in adulthood, schizophrenia, a bunch of different uh, risks, and then also in the next generation. Yeah. You know, in the last few minutes, and you both have been very, very generous, giving me so much of your time, but I'm really fascinated by the topic because it's it makes me sad um, that I, I see there's a lot that could be done and and you're mm -hmm. seems like you're walking an uphill battle but I do believe you're getting somewhere clearly there's better science there's a lot of things that are being done so kudos to everything but I want to finish with just a few things um, I believe so I'll start with Kimber so a woman is experiencing this uh, reaches out to your website what um, a what resources does she have and b what do you recommend uh, to her and c i know there's three questions but c um, i guess do you worry about that your recommendations contradict the recommendations of the ob gynae that she's under his or her care and how do you resolve these if any so when we get people contacting us uh, the first thing i do is get a kind of a basic history on them, kind of like I would as a nurse. And then I will look to see where the needs are, where the gaps are, and then I'll point them to our resources. So we have support groups. We can refer them to another physician. It's, it's very common that uh, patients have to change doctors because uh, their doctor just is not willing. So a lot of times I'll encourage them to take our resources, our algorithm protocol, our thiamine fact sheet, 
uh, things like that to their physician. And if their physician is completely unwilling to even consider looking at them, even some, print out some of our research depending on their situation, um, if they're just like, I'm not looking at that, that's Google Doc or whatever, then I will say, okay, maybe we need to try a different doctor because they're not willing to consider other options. Um, so then I will walk them through the treatment uh, that they need. But a lot of times my recommendations will be to talk to their physician about um, alternatives to oral medication, getting scheduled IV, ther IV therapy, outpatient, uh, getting basic vitamins like thiamine, that can make a huge difference in patients. So uh, there are times when what I suggest to them um, as I usually just go through our algorithm with them, basically, as uh, you know, there will be problems. Their doctor will not be comfortable prescribing those things. They've never heard of mirtazapine or a Zofran pump or uh, granisetron or some of the other medications. And so we'll have to give them some educational information uh, via our tools and resources. I'll be I'm usually um, available to meet with their physician if they'd like. Um, I will also bring in a May if needed uh, to talk with them. And then we'll just help them um, navigate through their pregnancy and um, encourage them to join our postpartum, you know, group in our groups to get support postpartum during our pregnancy, have a volunteer, you know, offer emotional support. We have a whole lot of resources like that to offer them. And the HD Care app, we have a free app that's available. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I want to get all of this because I would like to link those in the notes of the podcast. Um, Amy, how how do we overcome the psychological impact of this? I can only imagine the, you know, the psyche of someone who's gone through all of this, whether the, you know, the birth is a term, whether it's not, whether miscarriage, whether abortion, um, you know, I worry about suicide, huge depression, all of these things. Um, what, what can be done? I think Improving the care of the patient is really key because, and, and improving the support that patients get when their family believes them, when their doctor believes them, when um, they know they're being supported and cared for, um, that will decrease the trauma as well as when they're getting appropriate treatment and they feel better that will decrease the trauma. And then there also needs to be a recognition of the psychological impact and, uh, and close monitoring and referrals um, to mental health professionals if needed. During pregnancy with HG, that can be really hard. I mean, patients, they can't even do a one hour virtual therapy session talking because that's just not going to be possible for them. But it having somebody just believe their symptoms, tell them that they want to help them and actually, you know, work to try and help them have their family be supportive, um, help prevent some of the other psychosocial issues we have with um, financial, you know, bankruptcies and making sure that women get medical leave from work for this condition, that they get approved for disability when needed um, with this so that they, they don't have those other stressors and they're only dealing with the illness. I mean, I, I'm sure you know as an oncologist that, that being chronically ill is very traumatic and we need to recognize that and make sure that the supports are in place um, to prevent some of the trauma. Kelly, is there anything worse than telling a patient it's all in your head? There's nothing. There's nothing worse. I made a big sign at the for the recent conference to be sure <laughs> people know that it's genetic and not in their head. I mean, that being told as a very... I mean, it's just such a weak, sickened position. And a lot of women also don't have supportive families around them. It's just hard to understand unless you're really, unless you've, you can reflect back on the very, very worst, like stomach flu you've ever had and think about staying in that condition for nine months while you have the pressure of growing someone <laughs> inside of you. Just that combination is so incredibly overwhelming. So I can't overstate the importance of the doctor having compassion 
And if they don't know to do the research and try and find out or say, what, what have you heard? What do you think might help? And encourage that as well, because you know, nothing can be more panicky than being told this just in your head. So I guess in the last thing is maybe each one can just give us just, you know, la final thoughts as well as anything I may have forgotten to cover. I mean, just to remember, I'm not really familiar with this. I've learned so much. I, I admire all of you uh, tremendously. It's, it's just an amazing effort that you're doing. And hopefully we can get more people aware of what you are doing and and donate and, 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 and provide the financial, emotional, as well as intellectual support. Um, I will maintain that I think the more you get celebrities, frankly, involved with you because they just have the largest platform, uh, the better it is, including celebrities, podcasts, and, and, and others. Um, but maybe final thoughts from everyone, as well as commenting on anything I did not cover. I'll start with Marlena. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, because this is something that can possibly help people, is that we have a study that showed that 8.7% of people who did not take Zofran ended up having a therapeutic termination due to their severe HG. And that went down to 2% for people who took Zofran. So um, there's still a lot of patients and doctors that are afraid of the risk of prescribing Zofran, um, not as much maybe in the US as around the world, but definitely still in the US and some, for some doctors and patients. And so um, people have to recognize that 8.7% 8, 8 loss is a lot higher than any possible potential risk that Ondansetron has to the fetus. And so, um, you know, it's a risk benefit assessment and patients should be aware of that and their doctors should be aware of that as well. Anything else I may have forgotten to cover? Uh, I think that was my main point, you know, and I just really want to make the main points that um, we we know the cause is biological uh, and we, we, we uh, hopefully, uh, medications are on the way to treat that pathway. And we know there all are long-term outcomes for mother and baby. Um, and then I guess lastly, just that doctors need to know to check in on their patients because there is a high risk of suicidal ideation. There is a high risk of termination. And so, um, you know, when patients leave the hospital, oftentimes they end up coming back to the hospital multiple times um, and nobody's checking in on them to, to make sure that they're on a week to week basis, getting better and gaining weight. And um, so I think that there needs to be multiple check-ins on patients as well. Amy, anything I forgot to cover? Any last thoughts? Well, I think there is a ton of stuff that could be covered, but um, we've done a great job of hitting the highlights. And thank you so much for having us on here. And um, just, we love to talk about hyperemesis. And I, I did want to just add that all those resources that are on the Her Foundation website, um, there are resources for physicians specifically the there. What's the website? The It's um, uh, helpher.org. There's a bunch of hyperemesis.org. That's what we're, um, so there are a bunch of different um, resources on there and they're very well referenced um, with uh, good peer reviewed um, medical uh, uh, articles in them. And uh, so people Thank you. Thank you. should be able to use them. Kelly, any last thoughts? Anything I forgot to cover? I just would, uh, well, thank you so much for having us first. Um, I also, uh, for anyone who's watching or listening, um, if they, I, we're really open to collaboration and excited to collaborate with other people in the medical space. Um, and so please reach out to us if you have any ideas for us, or you can see a way in which we can collaborate. That would be wonderful. And um, you can reach me, or you can put it in the details, but I'm Kelly at hypermesis.org and I would love to hear from you. Kimber, I want to finish with you. I mean, you, you, you've started the foundation and you've gotten all of these folks together. Anything that I forgot to cover? Any last thoughts? And whatever you want listeners to know, please feel free to share. Well, I really appreciate you having us on here because the more awareness, the better. Because, you know, I've seen 
probably three women in the last few months that have lost 50 plus pounds. Um, and these are not women, you know, these are women who didn't have 50 pounds to lose. So, you know, this should not be happening in this, in this day and age. And I think one of the things that's striking to me is that, you know, this is still happening. And the women that we work with one-on-one -on -one from early in their pregnancy through their pregnancy tend to rarely have really severe complications. And it's really sad to me that like I was told that my pregnancy was a reject, my vomiting symptoms were a rejection of my pregnancy. And I was excited that I, I've been wanting to have a baby. I was 29. So, um, you know, it's sad that all these things, when you put all this together, you've got women being told they don't want to be pregnant. You're, you're allowing them to suffer for months, losing 30, 40, 50 pounds at times, having complications from ruptured esophagus as to, um, you know, suicidal ideation. We do have women who have died of suicide. Um, we have a lot of prematurity, preeclampsia, and, and then we have a lot of children that, that end up with these neurodevelopmental issues. Um, I, we've, we've personally gone through that and it's a very hard road. Um, they don't fit neatly into any diagnosis cri um, criteria. Um, so people don't know what to do with them. Parents are blamed. So you're blamed <laughs> for being sick and then you're blamed for all the problems, you know, the complications in your pregnancy and then you're blamed for your children's issues. So I say this to say that there are so many women that struggle emotionally and are, you know, carry a huge burden. And it's just a very long road for these women. And a lot of this is very preventable. You're giving them nutrition, early care, IV fluids, things like that, basic, uh, basic care. And in most other conditions, like if most patients came into the ER and they hadn't eaten in a week, they would give them vitamins and they would give them fluids. But you, you take the women that we work with and they're like, oh, you don't need vitamins. It's been two months since you've eaten. You don't need vitamins. So I guess it's just, it's a mind boggling place that we're at. And we see these women losing large amounts of weight. And then we see these children with, you know, mental health issues and um, autism and all kinds of things. And we know from the women that we work with that they can come through their pregnancies and do well if they're given really well, really good care. So I guess that's what I would like to leave is that these are not, these associations don't have to be associations 100% of the time with HG. They, we could make changes to their care and we have the resources and the opportunities. Uh, we have the resources and the capacity to make these changes. Um, and so we just are, look forward to maybe somebody in your audience being interested in working with us, partnering with us, helping us grow and uh, take these resources and this knowledge to a greater level so we can prevent. Because you think about it, the lifetime of care, medical care is double for a child with autism. And so we're looking at this huge burden on the healthcare system in the future because we're not taking care of, of the patients now. So I just think that's a really good thing for, for the healthcare community to understand. Treat the patient now or you're gonna treat the mother and the child later. So it's really, really important, so. Thank you, and the website is, is excellent. We will link to that. I, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate everything you're doing, and I certainly hope that more people become aware of this problem and become more active in fulfilling the vision and the mission of your foundation. And uh, I would love to have you again in six to uh, eight months and hopefully continue to witness the progress that you are doing. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it.